All right. So everyone, welcome. Happy Earth Day. Um, it's been a little bit windy and a little bit cold in some parts of the state, so not the best for getting outside. So I'm glad we uh, are doing this online thing so we can um, all gather from afar. Um, so welcome to our Speaking for Wildlife virtual presentation on New Hampshire's wild history, and we thank you for joining us. And for those that don't know me, my name is Zoe Aldeg. I'm the Outreach and Volunteer Manager at SELT. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not working. Wait a minute. Oh, we've got, we're having a couple technical difficulties, but we should be oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Far. Okay, there. Okay, so last week we had Enhancing Your Yard for Wildlife with Vicki. I think I saw a few uh, people who overlap in attendees. Um, and then this week we're here with Pete McVay doing New Hampshire's Wild History. And next week at 10.30 a.m. on Wednesday, uh, Sue Mayotte, who's here tonight, will be doing uh, her presentation on New Hampshire's Bats and White Nose Syndrome. Um, so for those who may not know SELT, uh, we are a nonprofit that conserves land uh, in southeastern New Hampshire for wildlife, drinking water, farms and fresh food, outdoor recreation, and healthy forests. And I think, oh, and this is the second in a series of the three webinars that SELT is presenting, like I said, uh, in conjunction with the with volunteers from the UNH Cooperative Extension Speaking for Wildlife program. And that program um, trains volunteers to give these amazing presentations and they were kind enough to let SELT use them for the series. So thank you, Cooperative Extension. Um, and then, so for a quick, a few quick housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, I've got everyone muted um, and I'll keep you muted unless you want to speak, in which case you can click raise hand and I'll, I'll be watching the participant area in the chat. And so you can, I can unmute you if you uh, would like to do that. We would love to have questions as we go. So feel free to raise your hand and we can allow you to talk or um, you can also just ask in the chat and I'll pop back up on the screen when I see a, um, a question and, and Pete will see that as a cue to, that we have a question. Um, so to find the chat, uh, there's, if you hover on the bottom of your screen, there's a chat icon. It looks like a little talking bubble. If you're on a computer, if you're on a smartphone, you can touch the screen and then you'll have to click the, the three dots and then you should see the chat option there. So um, I guess I already put in, I see that a lot of people, it looks like everyone's found where it is. We've got, um, from Newburyport and the Flemings are here, yay. Wolfboro, Kingston, I'm in Kittery, Maine. Feels like it's cheating because it's not New Hampshire, but I am from New Hampshire, so I count. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, I'll just be watching for uh, questions with the raised hand or the chat feature. And we really encourage you, don't be shy. We're here to learn and we're happy to be able to connect with you from afar. So it's, uh, Questions are encouraged and enjoyed. Um, without further ado, I will introduce today's speaker. Uh, with us today, we have Pete McVeigh. Pete spent 10 years as a high school science teacher, and that was followed by 30 years working in IT. Uh, he served 20 years on the Atkinson Conservation Commission and did another 10 years with the Coverts program. He was also a volunteer guide in the Harvard Museum of Natural History and um, while he studied biology in college, he should have realized then that he really wanted to be a naturalist. And now he's finally achieved the dream of being out in the woods most of the time, helping people appreciate and understand New Hampshire's great natural history. Um, so I will pass it over to you, Pete. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Zoe. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, I'll talk about 40 minutes. And feel free to ask questions, as Zoe said, through chat or raising your virtual hand, but I guess chat, chat is better. We'll explore how New Hampshire's land, animals, and people have challenged, changed over time. 
and what this means for New Hampshire today. So let's begin. New Hampshire has been settled by humans for 12,000 years. Before settlement, Northeast Native Americans had a sophisticated confederacy of tribes, and uh, you can see it there. Some of the names may be familiar, but it wasn't just New Hampshire. They were all the way from Quebec in the north, all the way down to New York State in the south. Of course, there weren't states then. There were many individual tribes with huge trading and partnership uh, networks. In fact, you could think of that entire area of the Northeast as being a, a, a country, a United States, each one, a, they being a nation and each one of the tribes being an independent state. So it was by no means a very primitive society. However, when European settlers arrived, disease wiped out most of this culture. Uh, we can relate to that. The Native American survivors were reduced to widely scattered small family units. Forests returned and took over the landscape. Well, our story will begin around 1750. At that time, there was little trade with Native Americans except for furs. Europeans established permanent colonies up and down the entire Atlantic coast. Settlers found that moving inland was relatively easy and they began to expand, except for Northeastern New England. Uh, in other words, from this area, I think you can see my cursor. They moved inland except this zone right here and north, oh, sorry. Was so overgrown and so heavily forested that it was uh, practically deserted. Even the, there weren't uh, Europeans and there were not natives living in much of that area either. But there was continual change, disturbances, even in this period, caused by human and natural events. Disturbances can be large or small. Single trees can fall and create gaps in the forest canopy. Now, this isn't a very good illustration of a gap in the canopy, but you can see spots here where probably a similar thing has happened. And if you go and walk through in the woods by yourself, uh, and you see trees down, look up and you'll see these open spaces where the trees used to be. And the, these are the young trees which will eventually fill in. And this is the way the forest renews itself. Uh, but large scale damage, even bigger, can be caused by hurricanes and tornadoes, ice storms, wind, and beavers. Beaver dams flooded large areas and beavers could be found on almost every watercourse in New Hampshire. Fires would also hit areas. They would clear large areas of land, but they were probably uh, pretty rare in the northern valleys and the northern part of the state. With all the natural human and human disturbances happening on this land, you can imagine what the forest might have looked like. A patchwork of old and young forest spotted with wetlands and abandoned beaver meadows, a diverse landscape. Wildlife was very abundant during this time. Deer, moose, turkey, woodcock. You see how hard he is to see there and uh, by the way, you'll probably hear the woodcocks now since they are just coming out. You hear this whirring of wings uh, on the edge of many of our forests, followed by a strange peeping sound, a, a buzz almost. Uh, but that's the woodcocks establishing their territory. And the last one, passenger pigeons. Passenger pigeons used to darken the air in 
crowds that were so large that they would be more than a mile wide and they would start flying at sunrise and the entire stream would continue flying until sunset. That's how many there were. Bobcats. We do have lots of bobcats around in this area. Uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game uh, is tracking them and I believe they even have a bobcat uh, location map uh, on their uh, website. But, and they come out to towns and do talks about not just bobcats but all the other things they track and observe and preserve. Lynx. Now, uh, a lynx is, looks similar to a bobcat, but there's two differences. See the huge, huge ruff of fur. Those of you that are familiar with Maine Coons know about that one. Also, the lynx has these two pointed tufts right at the top of the ears. And another one, a wolf, and even cougars. Now, there have been reported sightings of cougars in New Hampshire uh, within the last five to 10 years, and there have been signs of cougar, but no one has ever managed to photograph one. So we know they're there, but we can't find them. And of course, beavers and muskrats, which were everywhere. Both Native Americans and Europeans had the same attitude nor toward nature and wildlife. It was a valuable resource. Both groups depended upon the land for food, clothing, shelter, tools, and trade. Furs were a valuable commodity for clothing and trade for both peoples. The land was beginning to change by the late 1700s. Europeans began moving into the interior Although native populations cleared land for hunting, agriculture, and villages, Europeans did this on a much larger scale because they had iron tools and it was part of their culture. The Europeans cleared vast areas for agriculture and pasture. Wild game was still a primary food source and became increasingly important as the human population grew. There were no hunting seasons or limits so any species was fair game at any time of the year. But as agriculture increased, mostly among the Europeans, there was a shift in attitudes toward wildlife. Game animals were still a serious, uh, uh, were a big source of food, but other wildlife were considered nuisances. Raccoons, bears, and porcupine could damage crops. Martin, fox, and skunks might raid the hen houses. Wolves and cougars threatened livestock. At the same time, fur trading had almost ended. Beaver hats were out of style and the beaver population was depleted. The shift in land use and the attitudes toward wildlife continued into the next century. By 1830, agriculture was at its peak approximately 60 to 80% of New Hampshire was cleared for crop and pasture lands. New Hampshire went from being mostly forest to now being mostly open. Oh, <laughs> I have to turn my page. Yes, I'm using notes. <laughs> New species began appearing in Western grassland and began appearing. Western grassland birds and uplands uh, and found farm fields very attractive. These feathered immigrant, excuse me, these feathered immigrants were bobolinks, meadowlarks, and upland sandpipers. Each of them required different sizes of grassland to build their nests. Bobolinks will build nests in grasslands as small as five acres. And we're coming up on spring where I want to just mention something. You'll see in wide areas like this, you may see a blackbird with this distinctive cap. And you'll hear, it's impossible to duplicate, but it's a burbling, warbling sound, bubbling 
almost, as they fly up, up, up in the air and then circle around and fly back down. This is how they attract the females, which should be coming shortly after them. Next is the meadowlark. Eastern meadowlarks require 15 acres or more, and they have an incredibly sweet and beautiful song. Upland sandpipers require at least 100 acres. Uh, you can imagine how much land was being cleared if it was attracting birds like these to nest. But other bird species didn't do as well. The 1800s were the height of what was called market farming. Wildlife was hunted for personal consumption, but also was sold to restaurants and uh, grocers, especially down in New York City. There was a, a tremendous demand for it in those days. Okay, we have a quick question. Um, ah. And it's actually from Melissa Pollard, who I believe is related to you, your stepdaughter and son-in-law are here. So Melissa is wondering why those birds a couple slides back um, required so much land. Uh, that, that's a very good question and I don't have a very good answer other than it, uh, a lot of it has to do with an animal's foraging habits and not just birds. For example, any predator, no matter what their size, uh, there is literally a one to 10 ratio. In other words, uh, for every square foot that a, a, the uh, prey occupies, the predator requires 10 square feet. Or even in more perspective, uh, it would be 10 miles per one mile. The reason for that is the prey generally are herbivores or scavengers, and they don't have to go very far. But uh, if you're a fox and you want to catch a rabbit, you're not going to find something within the 10, 100, or 50 feet. Uh, but in the case of the birds, that's kind of far afield because the, the difference in the bird also does depend quite a bit on their uh, feeding habits. Um, the bobolink, I do know, catches, uh, is an insectivore and uh, they can pretty much find what they want within the uh, fields themselves. Uh, the, let me go back. Who was the other one here? Oh yes, the meadowlark. The meadowlark also catches insects, but usually catches them in the air on the fly. So that requires a little more territory. And I have no idea what the upland sandpiper eats, but obviously it requires a huge amount of space. Um, that's an interesting question. And I'll have to do some more research on it. I have another follow-up question. Um, Zach uh, and Melissa says, thank you for that. That was great. Um, and Zachariah is, uh, is curious about the history of the caribou and their local extirpation. Um, he's heard that they were in the White Mountains until the early 1900s. What economic or ecological reaches did they fill that are now vacant? Um, actually, they, when I mentioned that humans were here uh, 12,000 years ago, uh, this was a period when the last ice age was retreating. Uh, strangely enough, there was a period of time where suddenly the ice age came back in with a vengeance. Uh, we know this from geological records and looking in at the soil. What is quite curious is that was the time that humans began to appear in this area. Uh, the prevailing theory based upon uh, excavations of the Paleolithic Indians showed an awful lot of caribou bones. And the theory, therefore, is that the caribou were sweeping into this area and the humans followed them. But as far as why did they become extinct later on? I believe caribou are a, an Arctic species. And as the climate got warmer, and this is from about uh, 10,000 years ago to 6,000 years ago, the climate was warming up very much. And uh, a lot, I know they did move north, but I don't know what other factors might have contributed to it. 
hunting, certainly. Another okay. question for me to look up. Great, thank you. That's great. All right. Ah, we we're talking about market hunting. These are ducks that were shot and sold uh, on the market in New York City and also eaten at home. I mean, uh, I mentioned, for example, the clouds of passenger pi pigeons that were just fantastic. Well, there were any other species you can name, well, any kind of bird, any kind of animal, where you found one, you usually found hundreds. So it's an unlimited supply. We don't have to worry about that. The bounty is great. This thing is called a punt boat. And there are some of them uh, still around, uh, but not used for what they were used for in this case. That long thing you see coming down the middle of the boat is not a spar, it's a gun. And they would sit in the stern, well actually they would load it. <laughs> it's a, kind of difficult to do, but they would load it with gunpowder and uh, scrap metal. Um, so that a single shot from the fuse back here, it was lit like a cannon, you could take down an entire flock of geese, ducks, anything else on the water. Uh, it was incredibly effective. I mean, you could, you could wipe out an entire pond in about a half hour. That's the sort of uh, hunting they were doing. And that's why the animals were endangered. There were still no hunting seasons or bag limits. This led to huge decreases, not just in birds, but in moose, deer, turkey, grouse, and many other wildlife species. But from the 1850 on, there was large-scale agriculture began to disappear. Now here we do know why. Many people migrated west where the soil was rich and plentiful and rock free, which was pretty important. Crops could be raised cheaply at large quantities and the New England farmers simply couldn't compete. As people migrated west, the abandoned farms quickly returned to young forests, as I showed in the previous slide. Uh, so I think, sorry to interrupt again, we have another question from Sue. Sue has her hand raised, so Sue, I'm going to press allow to talk and then you can ask your question live. All right, oops. Okay. Okay, we can hear, can you hear Pete? Yes. Okay. okay. I, I didn't see something about the caribou. Oh, that's uh, I'm sorry, we're having, uh, could you lean a little closer to your microphone? Um, I'd like to add something about the caribou. Okay, okay. good. That they were here as late as 1920 in Maine and northern New Hampshire, but they were used for food by the loggers, and that's when they were finally extirpated out of here. Um, they were way up in the north, but that was it's similar to using the buffaloes in the west. They used the caribou for food. Uh, when we were okay, she was kind of breaking up there, but uh, for those of you that, uh, as Sue said, the uh, caribou were being were used as food for loggers, uh, so there was a, a vast, they were overhunted. I believe that's what you said? Yes, I did. Okay, by the way, uh, Sue and I have a very close partnership, and often uh, do walks in the woods and uh, do a lot of uh, uh, do a lot of uh, leading of uh, woodland trails. Uh, what am I trying to say? Wildlife walks. Yeah, Sue and I are married. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, well, I'm glad I, d I don't have to look this up now. See, she knows as much as I do in a lot of things and more. Uh, back to this thing. What happened was as the farms shrank, uh, got smaller, and they were being, uh, the 
people moving west in these huge expanses of very rich, very easily cultivated toil, uh, soil, uh, New Englanders simply couldn't compete. And the stories as to why and how this particular design came about uh, is a very long one. But uh, there is a book online called Big House, Little House, Back House, Barn, which will tell you about the history. And it is really fascinating. Basically, what happened was the farmers that were left uh, were, could not compete. As big as the farms were, they couldn't produce the kind of crops they could in the West. So they had to change their style of farming. And they did en masse. Uh, they went from single crops to multiple crops to maybe a few ducks and chickens to ducks, chickens, hogs, goats, sheep, cows, cattle, animals like that. And this required a whole different organization of their farm. And this arrangement you see here uh, not only helped the farming industry, but to get by Every farmer had a second job. Uh, he might have been a blacksmith, a furrier, even a shoemaker, a carpenter, a carpent, a uh, furniture maker, a weaver, and so on and so on. So these extra houses uh, were actually the factories where they did both things, and that's how they were able to survive. There was another big change toward the end of the 1800s. Forestry was replacing agriculture as the main use of land. More trees, they were taking over. Wood was valuable because modern materials like structural steel, plastics, and even cardboard were not yet available. These changes put tremendous pressure on the wildlife. Many animals could not survive the loss of their habitat in overhunting. By 1900, the passenger pigeon was extinct. When you consider that the millions and millions and perhaps billions of birds to suddenly disappear within a period of 10 years, that's kind of staggering. Wolves, cougars, turkey, and beaver were all extirpated from the state. Uh, that meant they no longer existed in New Hampshire, though they still existed elsewhere. Woodcock numbers were so low that they were expected to become extinct. Moose, deer, grouse, bobcat, marten, and fisher were all in their lowest numbers ever. There were believed to be only about 50 moose left in New Hampshire. Uh, by the way, it was deer, uh, Henry Walden in his uh, books in 1830, wrote uh, something that he was very excited about because that morning he had seen a deer. That tells you how low the population had got. But the rapid decline of both forests and wildlife helped to give a new boost to a conservation ethic, something new. In the late 1800s, New Hampshire Fish and Game established hunting seasons in bag limits. They required hunting licenses and enforced hunting regulations. The federal government moved to protect new land and wildlife. The Weeks Act in 1911 gave the federal government the power to purchase private land and establish national forests and preserve. The Federal Wildlife Restoration Act of 1937 put a 10% tax on ammunition and firearms used for sport hunting. This money was distributed to individual states for wildlife restoration. Uh, this act still is important. It funds wildlife habitat management, species conservation, uh, species conservation, land acquisition, scientific research, and wildlife and hunting education. This new conservation ethic had a significant impact on wildlife populations. However, another factor was the continuing return of farmland to forest. Young forests are particularly important to wildlife because they provide dense thicket-like growth, which is an ideal habitat for species like 
grouse, woodcock, moose, deer, and New England cottontail rabbits. You've probably heard about the rabbits because they are a subject of uh, intense study and conservation uh, efforts uh, in this area. So we hate to bring them back. And there are also many other species. And there's also new species coming in. The coyote, the eastern coyote now, was suddenly appeared or began to appear around 1944. And now he is found everywhere in the state. Um, we are talking earlier about animal habits. Uh, coyotes are one animal that don't mind being around humans. They love to go into the areas where humans are because they know there's food. But having said that, the biggest threat to wildlife from 1960 on is human settlement. Uh, as mentioned earlier, many animals migrated uh, from the west to the east as land was cleared. Now, all of a sudden, as more and more humans were taking away this land or using it for other purposes, the, it put tremendous pressure on the animals to survive. And that accelerated into today. What's happened is, uh, sorry, I got out of sequence. But what happened was that uh, from the 1950s on, there was a big change in what was considered, um, sorry, there was a big change in what, how the land was produced. There were more tract homes. There were malls, there were shopping markets, there was something else that began to increase, super highways, parking lots. All of this takes away habitat. It um, today's development is different. The modern building techniques and an expanding population mean that changes to the lands are on a wider scale, happen much faster, and are permanent. We were talking earlier about houses being built and also the natural disasters, fire, flood, uh, hurricanes, uh, landslides, things like that. And even the beavers, when the beavers dammed up water and rivers, that's only temporary. The land is restored, but modern buildings, uh, unless <laughs> someone walks away from a house, uh, Everything stays, and that's a big difference between what we're doing today and what happened in the past, and is one of the biggest threats to our animals around. Deer, bobcat, beaver, moose, and even turkeys. They are coming back, but they are in serious danger by all this development. And this is what I just talked about. Uh, I, I have to redo these slides, please bear with me. But this is a spread out area, but here, even though it looks like a nice forested area, it is sterile as far as uh, supporting wildlife is concerned. There is nothing here to attract an animal, nothing at all. Uh, no, Food on the ground, mast, no place to hide, and the hawks are very good at finding them, and so on and so on. However, to help with this, wildlife biologists in the state fish and game, nonprofit organizations, UNH Cooperative Extension, and many other groups have been working to raise awareness about wildlife species and habitats that are rare in New Hampshire. This means that we have to go out and talk to 84,000 private landowners. Over 80% of the land in New Hampshire is privately owned. We depend on these landowners to provide habitat, clean water, recreational opportunities, and other values that all of us can enjoy. 
and there are many other examples of habitats and species that deserve special attention. Uh, grasslands, shrublands, forests, peatlands, vernal pools, and what you're looking at here are all descriptions of each of these habitats, which the, you can get uh, through uh, the cooperative extension, uh, UNH cooperative extension, and uh, these are called the Habitat Stewardship Series. If you know of or own any one of these properties, uh, this will tell you how you can take care of them uh, effectively, or at the very least, uh, show you what can be done to prevent them from deteriorating further. As Granite Staters, oh, the New, uh, New Hampshire Wildlife Plan, originally developed in 2005. This plan is a very, started as a very comprehensive survey and the survey was made so that the plan could come up. Now this is updated in 2015 and I don't know what the, um, what the progress is, but I do know it is being updated to look at all these habitats that the state has and develop plans to manage them. Ah, that's what I was looking for. This map was actually developed from the wildlife plan and so shows the location of many of our key habitats in the state. And for each one of these, there is a plan to develop, protect it, but also to open it to visitors in ways that will preserve the land. Get involved. I can't tell you how wonderful it is being a volunteer for this, uh, these projects. Uh, CELT also, they're, they're fantastic. And you, it's, it's great fun going out there and the things you learn from other people and just about the woods, the wildlife, the uh, meadows and everything else, it, it, it is wonderful. Uh, here are a couple of um, sites which can help you find both things to do and places to go that you might never have thought of. Uh, NewHampshireWoods.org, WildNewHampshire.com. And really, if you want to uh, just get started, all you have to do is uh, Google, uh, just put in Wild New Hampshire or Natural New Hampshire, and you will come up with all kinds of sites. Uh, now that I finish, I'd just like to thank the organizations the, who sponsor the Speaking for Wildlife project, and they're really great. The New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and the Davis Conservation Foundation, they do grants that support the creation of this, this series, Speaking for Wildlife. There are many topics, and uh, we go across the state to libraries and schools, wherever they would like a, play, a presentation. The UNH Cooperative Extension uh, for the support of the Speaking for Wildlife uh, volunteers, of which I'm one, uh, and are the underpinnings of this project. They really uh, manage it well and have a, uh, a schedule that we can follow. And New Hampshire Fish and Game, a research presentation and work on the Wildlife Action Plan are the basis for this presentation, and they continue to provide support for the program. And uh, you're probably aware of, uh, not CSI, but it's the, the Ranger uh, program in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, they're on TV, and it's a rather interesting series. Well, this concludes it, and thank you for listening. And now I'll take questions and so everybody doesn't try to talk at once, I'll ask you to raise your hand or tap the waving hand button, which is down in your corner there, and you will be unmuted by uh, Zoe. Well, while people are thinking of their questions, we do have, um, Paula is wondering, 
um, if you can discuss the Cupboards program. Oh, thank you. Tell yes, us a little better about that. Well, what, uh, the Cooperative Extension has, I've lost track. Uh, when I went into Cupboards, they had eight different uh, programs that you could get into. Now I think they have 14 or 15 at least. Uh, Coverts is one of them, and the word itself is actually a French word. Everybody thinks it means covert, but what it, a covert is an animal home. That's its literal meaning. But Coverts volunteers, we do many things. We give presentations like this. We also, I mentioned back there that 80% uh, of the land is in private hands. The people who own land and they want to know what they can do with it, they can contact the UNH Cooperative Extension and uh, just, just give some quick things. And then someone will go out, a coverts volunteer, such as myself, and meet with the people and find out what they want to do with their land. And that's, that's one program. By the way, when we go out there, we don't go out with any preconceived ideas. First, we sit down with them and say, what do you want to do? And it could be many, many different things. And then we will go out and examine the land and get some ideas and talk to them again. And then we'll call someone who, bring in someone who is a real expert, forester, gardener, naturalist, whatever, who will talk to them about things they might do with their land. And that service is completely free. And if you are a landowner of 20 acres or more, uh, just contact uh, Cooperative Extension and they would love to help you in this. Um, I have, uh, I'm gonna unmute Helen so that she can ask a question live. And then I see another question coming through in the chat. So we'll go with Helen first and then we'll go to Charmaine right after. So I'm unmuting Helen now. Well, I have um, two things to say. We're talking about um, the, the, all the, the homes being built in New Hampshire. And I would just like to say that my, my father built a cabin on Lovell Lake in Sanbonville in the oh, late huh? 1930s. And the, the, um, um, there are hundreds of thousands of vacation cabins all over New Hampshire, and I think that also affected the habitat. The other thing I just would like to say that you were talking about the little house, big house, back house, barn, and that is actually a program in the New Hampshire Humanities to Go series, so that you, once the um, quarantine is over, you can go to Humanities to Go and bring Mr. Taylor, who's the former Secretary of Agriculture for the state of New Hampshire, who talks about that program and the book he wrote. So um, those are just my two comments about Pete's presentation. And uh, we've actually had Mr. Taylor come and talk with us also about um, One Room Schoolhouses. That's another program he does, but he's a very fine presenter and is part of that Humanities to Go series. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you, Kay. I just wanted to add one thing that you reminded me that isn't in this slide. Yes, uh, the houses are being built, but at the same time, in the last 15 years, the people have been moving from the country to more populated areas, not necessarily cities, but towns. And that is having a significant change to the wildlife. Seen any bears lately? Anyway. We have them all over the state, including Atkinson. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do have a question from Charmaine, back to the caribou. Was there an effort to reintroduce the woodland caribou to Maine or New Hampshire that you know of? Not that I know of. And uh, one of the reasons they're not being introduced is, like I said, they are an Arctic species. And uh, we are certainly not Arctic at the moment. No, doesn't look like it's going, going that way. Oh, Zachariah Johnson is saying, uh, yes, they tried twice in Maine, but they died from brainworm in the 70s. Oh my, so, okay. 
that doesn't sound very pleasant. Um, I don't know much about that stuff. Uh, let me just share the link here. They brought them down from Newfoundland. Paula just shared a link about bears. Let's see what it says. Oh, I don't know if it worked. Uh, I don't know if that link worked, Paula, but we, we can talk offline. But um, does, oh, it's a video of bears in Goffstown. Yes, mm -hmm. I saw, I've seen bear just in really residential neighborhoods around here. Like I remember um, like just in Durham in the, you know, in the kind of cul-de-sacs that they have out there. So they're around. Um, does anyone else have questions? I will see if I can get that link for everyone. Um, Zachariah is saying the proliferation of white-tailed deer in New England is limiting the numbers of both moose and preventing the return of caribou because of brainworm that you get when too many deer are in a given space. Huh. Uh, yes, we've, we've gone from um, poverty to overabundance. Uh, when the New Hampshire Fish and Game began really uh, managing all species of wildlife in the 1930s, there were less than 30,000 deer in the state. Today, numbers in the millions, uh, obviously. Um, there have been all kinds of ideas on how they can control and get rid of the population. Um, cold hunting is one way, extending the hunting season and also introducing wolves and other natural predators. But so far, the deer are quite more, uh, quite resilient. Yes, I know that in, there was a big uh, controversy last summer in Newcastle. There are deer that are eating everyone's gardens and kind of they've taken over the island of Newcastle. And um, there was talk of calling them and uh, people were very upset because they're so cute and, you know, People don't understand the populations. Um, Zachariah also said wolves and cougars would make hiking more interesting, not necessarily safer, but definitely more interesting. I agree. Uh, is that well, true? <laughs> comment on that that I heard from another naturalist. Um, wolves, you know where they're around by the sound of it. Uh, coyotes, the same way. Deer, the same way. Cougar, you'll know a cougar is there when he or she pounces you. Yep. Um, I just saw um, our executive director, Brian, shared a video that I think one of his, one of our board members sent to him. He's got a daughter living in Colorado who uh, they had snow the other day and she had videos of two mountain lions roaming around um, the driveway and you would just never see them out but because everyone's staying home right now and and that wildlife is really creeping out from in all the cracks and I know Sherry who's here right now got some amazing footage of some fox playing in her yard so I see Sherry's here and hopefully we'll be able to share that footage um but yeah the wildlife is wildlife you wouldn't necessarily see is kind of coming out of the coming out of the cracks and taking back over which is in I think it's a nice silver lining, but maybe not everyone agrees. Well, we're all uh, we're all on this planet together, and uh, just because an animal looks terrible or seems terrible to us, doesn't mean that it uh, it doesn't have some ben benefit and is magnificent magnificent in its own way. Uh, some of the most thrilling encounters I've had have been when the animal was known to be really vicious, like coming up over a wall and coming face to face with a fisher. Ooh. Yeah, but that was, that was really thrilling. Um, well, I don't see any more questions. Does anyone have anything else they wanted to ask? 
And you can always, um, you can always email me. You, you should all have my email. Um, and I can put you in touch with Pete if you think of questions later. And um, I guess if that's it, then I would say, I will say thank you so much, Pete. This was a really great presentation. I um, really enjoyed learning about all this stuff. I've, I've learned a lot today. Um, Al and Ryan will say hello. Margie says, thank you for the program. Um, it seems that everyone's having a good time. Remember folks, sign up for next week's. Uh, it's at 1030 in the morning, so it's different time change. We're just kind of throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks in this crazy time. So um, we're going to try 1030 in the morning. Sue Mayotte will be presenting about bats and white nose syndrome. So that'll be great. Um, and happy Earth Day. Thank you for coming and uh, we'll follow up with a survey and thank you so much, Pete. Thank you too, Zoe, and all of you for attending. All right, well, well have a great okay. night. And I hope to see you on the trails and in the woods. Yes, you too. Great. Right. And...